I've uh, I looked I've I've been listening to Nick Heist for about I don't know seven or eight years now. I'm 26 years old, by the way. I was just gonna ask. Uh, I've heard I've read a couple of different stories on different forums about how your band formed at a, at from the church that Black Flag used to live in. So, but I wanted to ask you. So what is the story, the origin of Nick Heist? <laughs> well, um, I don't know if you know who Eugene is. Um, and I'll send you a picture of me, Spot, and Eugene, and we all kind of look a little black, <laughs> and Eugene and Spot are half black. So we used to uh, live in a place called Holly, Holly, Hollywood and Western, Eugene and I, and uh, as the story goes, we were, we were squatting in this very scalar, dirty place, that there were rats and all kinds of people running around, hookers, Ooh. pimps. And it was about 90% black. So we were punkers in there. And people <laughs> people were always stealing from us uh, shit, you know, um, stealing our shit, beating us up and shit because we were punkers. And so we came up with a term from there, nigg heist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's uh now, now nowadays that's totally uh un un PC but you know back then uh times were different. Right? <laughs> I was gonna say the name of your band definitely does stick out amongst a lot of hard, other hardcore acts and uh <laughs> if he has Nigga Heist I know it was from eighty one to eighty five, right? Or something like that, eighty six. You know, uh my under my dates are, you know, kind of like not the best you know my mind my mind isn't uh ordered uh by dates like some people's are <laughs> <laughs> so the the first uh or the, technically the only nick heist there's only one album right the self-titled album i think it's called snort my load right <laughs> yeah snort my load. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's pretty funny <laughs> yeah how did you guys um so what was nick heist is a very sexually charged hardcore, I want to say, comedic type of band in comparison to other bands around that area. Um, what was the dr the drive to uh, create sort of a band like that, since I understand you are the founder? Yeah, it's my band. I founded it. Um, I came up with the name. Uh, I wrote a lot of the songs. But in the beginning, it was like, you know, it's kind of like uh, everyone has a blog or everyone has a Facebook or a website. Back then, you know, everyone had a band. And so um, I don't know, you know, what would be an uh, analogy here with what's going on in our society now. But everyone had a band. So I started a band with, with people. I lived in, um, I lived in the hood, uh, the barrio, in a place called Artesia. With a bunch of vatos kicking my ass, and so we had a little band, and and in the band uh, it was just people in the neighborhood that we would the punkers in the neighborhood in the beginning, and I called it niggas. So I was the lead singer, and there was an African American guy in the bunker in the band with us, and a couple of uh, a couple of Latinos just in the neighborhood neighborhood punkers that we started to do it, and then I got involved with Black Flag, and then it kind of just the name and everything I did just kind of went with went with me right yeah i've read stories where on the many of the nigga heist shows you've uh there have been sexual acts performed on stage um yeah um uh simulating a anal intercourse one time we were thrown in jail i was thrown in jail for that oh uh, shit and uh but there was no it was all simulation there was no um real stuff you know there was no there was no uh you know there was nothing there was not a live sex act when? i don't think I don't, I don't think i could get it up in front of five thousand people yeah that might be a little difficult <laughs> a little hard bro <laughs> but uh what are the quotes up and off of wikipedia here just uh, you know, have you heard of loudwire before they do a wikipedia fact or fiction there's one, no. there's one little uh, verse on Wikipedia in your history that I wanted to just read you real quickly, just to, if it's true or not. On stage, Mugger played naked or in his underwear and would always wear a long-haired wig with a trucker cap and taunt punks and skinheads in the audience who didn't want to see, quote, any long-haired faggot on stage. Mugger also baited the crowd with statements like, 
I know you're kind, you want to overthrow the government, and if you think I'm a faggot, why don't you come up here and let me butt fuck you while also asking female concert goers for sexual flight favors? Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's not- that sounds about right. I can't argue with that, bro. <laughs> wow. So were these Nick Haishu is pretty fucking wild then? Oh, yeah, it was wild, man. Um, you know, you'd go up there, but, it, you know, it's kind of like I think people, you know, they would see Bill Stevenson or, or um, um, uh, you know, Dez or, you know, other people or, or uh, you know, other, other black flag people in the band. So a lot of people that maybe could do harm knew we were just kind of it's kind of like a joke band so um. yeah it's kind of what i got from like a parody of other hardcore because i see you've had uh bill stevenson in the band uh spot the drums you said chuck biscuits ian mckay yeah. played on the bass kira what was it like having kira in the band you know i don't remember i i i i mean kira probably played but i i don't you know vividly remember her um um playing and i'm playing in the band i mean she was she's sort of a you know a feminist and and she would be against uh, all that kind of stuff so <laughs> i know i don't i gotta bring her up on this i don't really remember her but you know you know my memory is a little bit you know jarred um so sometimes i forget things yeah i get that can you tell me about october faction oh um I'm not exactly sure about October Faction. I know that Tom Tricoli was in it, and I believe Chuck was in it, and it was sort of a hippie band. But it was, you know, it was kind of like they tried to, you know, we did our whole Mig Heist thing, and so I stopped working for, I stopped touring with Black Flag, and they needed another uh, opening band because we didn't want some, you know, uh, generic punk band to play. So I believe they came up with October Faction to sort of fill the, fill the the void that was left by nig heist so it was more in in that time they were they started to get into smoking weed and and the grateful dead and and, <laughs> and mahavishnu orchestra and penguin Ca- cafe orchestra and all these kind of spaced out sort of bands and so they sort of uh, october faction sort of mimic that and to be honest with you i have never listen to October Faction. I've, I've never listened to it in my whole life. <laughs> I was going to ask if it would be similar to Minute Flag, if you have heard of that one. I have not heard of Minute Flag. It's kind of, the what you just explained, it's kind of the same thing, only it's between members of Black Flag and the Minutemen. There's two grasshoppers fucking on the cover. Oh, is that who made two grasshoppers fucking? Yeah, there's two grasshoppers covered. <laughs> Minute, wait, I get, wait, hold on a second. I don't believe you. I don't think it's... I think somebody just made that shit up. No, it was released in uh, 1986 on SST. Oh, you're right. Yeah, it's eight, 1986. It's a very experimental... It, it, the way you just described October Faction, you can use that to describe Minute Flag. So I'm wondering. Oh, I think it's. I think it was just. It was just. A, it was just a jam. Who was on the? Who was on the the record? It's oh, D Boone Gin. Yeah. Okay. I've always what? found the cover to be funny. Two grasshoppers fucking. <laughs> no, it doesn't. This doesn't make any sense because when when Kira was in the band, I think D Boone was dead. I mean, if you look at, if you, when did D. Boone die, right? Um, I, I, I think that there's something, there's... Oh, what the hell? Yeah, he died in eight, in December of 85, it says here. Yeah, and so this was released, oh, it says recorded in March of 85. So, yeah, maybe he was around. Yeah, so that makes sense. But I, <laughs> so maybe my, my order of news is wrong, but yeah, I mean... It's a jam band, you know, who wants, it's kind of like, it's kind of like listening to some, you know, a jam band is like listening to some, um, what's a good analogy, listening to some pro basketball player or football player or soccer player talking about politics, you know, who wants to listen to, who wants to listen to some guy talk about politics, he's been playing sports all his life, what does he know, right? <laughs> 
And so this, you know, who wants to listen to these guys jam, right? It's like, it's like that. I get you. Yeah, it says here that uh, when Kira Rossler played bass in the band, she was hidden behind the curtain and a man pretended to play on stage. I'm reading this off of Wikipedia. Oh, and that could, you know, and that, that could be true, but um, I don't think Kira liked me that much, so. Oh. <laughs> I've had a few uh. people just, uh, I've had, I, I got a couple of friends who are, pretty big fan of fans of hers and they're like hey she was in a she was in a guy she ought to bring her up i was like yeah i saw that um yeah, yeah, yeah. The... Uh, but no she was i mean i think it was that is that it's just a uh necessity that we didn't have a ba we didn't have somebody who knew how to play bass so um whatever reason uh she was there and so she agreed to but she didn't want to go on stage right because yeah she doesn't want to be associated with these um you know, uh, horny punkers. <laughs> so what what do you do today? Actually, I teach. I'm a teacher. Oh, nice. What what subjects? I teach at a, a couple of community colleges. Oh, nice. Uh, what um what subjects is? Earth, uh, computer science. Computer science. Is uh, is Nig Heist the only like how many bands from then till now have you been a part of? Uh, exactly one, the Nick Heist. I mean, I'm tone deaf, I'm colorblind, I'm, I'm, you know, my brain isn't, uh, my brain is more like, uh, linear, like, uh, you know, I'm good in math and shit like that, so I am not the, the, um, the a prototype, uh, rock and roll person. I mean, if I was, if I could sing and if I could dance and I was good looking, they would have put me in Black Flag, trust me. <laughs> But because they know I couldn't sing, right, uh, you know, um, why would they want me in their band? They actually they actually wanted me to drum for them. And I practiced with Black Flag for a while when Robo was having problems with, um, with uh, um, his green card getting back in the country. So I was practicing with them, but I don't have any rhythm. Oh. So you just uh, kind of like Spike Cassidy and D.R.I. to a, to a degree? Yeah, yeah. I don't know who Spike Cassidy and D.I.R. D.I.R. is, but... <laughs> D Dirty Rotten Imbeciles? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that. I know they that. have a song called Tone Deaf Again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I kind of see similarities there. You two can carry your vocal range pretty loudly. I, I can see yeah, similarities. Yeah, just screaming, there. bro. I mean... <laughs> so what eventually... Saw the demise of of the Nick Heist. Well, good question. You know, um, at that point, you know, in your life, you kind of think, you know, what am I going to do? You start to get paranoid. I mean, I didn't really have a family. Um, you know, I'm hanging around with these these guys that you know this. You know, at one point, SST and Black Flag, it was like a a uh, sort of um, um, helter skelter. Um, Charles Manson sort of you oh, know, gang of people hanging out together and fucking working hard and 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 you know that was our life you know it was twelve hours a day seven days a week of nonstop working DUI and so um, once they broke up and then I was an owner of SST Records. Oh, you were an uh, owner of the record label. Yeah, yeah, I was owner of the record label, so I ran the record label when they were out uh, doing their tours. That's why I stopped touring with them. So I was an owner of SST Records, uh, and then my part, one of my partners was named Joe Carducci, and Joe Carducci split because he couldn't handle Greg and Chuck because they're sort of, um, um, they're not, they're, they're, they're thinkers, they're not businessmen, right? Oh. So, and then after I left, you know, they stopped paying the bands, they started cheating people, and it just all kind of, it all kind of, you know, just fizzled out, and so now they just have you know, old stuff that they're doing because no one trusts them. So, so to get back to the question, why did it stop? Why did, why did I stop doing it? Because, you know, I started working for the label and, and making it work. And so it was me and, and Joe Carducci that had one faction uh, and it was like half of us. And then Greg and Chuck sort of, we had sort of this like, um, you know, a cold war. <laughs> <laughs> With with those two, and they stopped. You know, they didn't like us, and so they came up with their own record label at the time called um, um, what the fuck is it called? Some Hispanic Cruise, 
they came up with Cruz Records because we didn't like some of the stuff that they were doing, like October Faction and some of the other bands. And so, um, you know, uh, so uh, Joe left, and then it was just me with only one third of the, with one third of the record label against those guys with two thirds. So I was outnumbered, and so, you know, at that point I was just, you know, um, doing all of the business work, you know, like the accounting, the record label distribution, paying the bands, paying the people that work there, hired people to do the work, just managing the business aspect of it. And then I left. I said, fuck this. I can't handle those guys. So I left. I quit. And they bought me out. So that money, I, you know, I'm poor dude. You know, I'm not used to spending money. I'm not used to spending money now, right? So I just put that all, I just invested all of that into uh, at that point, you know, the stock market and mutual funds. So, oh. so that's where um, people say, but you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not, people, I'm not rich. I mean, there are fucking people that are super rich, right? I'm not super rich. I'm, I'm middle class. Only, only reason I brought that up is because a lot of people who I've told that I was going to interview you, they're like, oh, dude, he's a multimillionaire. You gotta ask him how he, how he went from <laughs> nigga heist to being all the way up there. It's like, oh, okay, which. Well, you see the you see the the progression, right? From uh, Rody to Nig Heist to their 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 manager on the road, where I managed their money. I took the money in. I I and you know I I managed you know I just did budgets all the time, and then to the record label, and they bought me out. So, damn. Yeah, I was gonna do a tangent question on SST, but you pretty much just answered it because I was the moment you told me you used to own S part of SST, I was going to ask about all the allegations of um I don't want to use the word fraud, but the allegations of them not paying bands. But you just you answered that anyway. Yeah, they don't they don't they don't pay the band. In fact, I signed about uh, I signed Who's Produce contract. I signed Minutemen's contract. I signed the contracts with them, and so the lawyers were coming to me. <laughs> Um, like, hey, uh, you know, we're going to, uh, I think it's called disposition you, is that, uh, or subpoena you, um, I think the term is. Yeah, they're going to subpoena me, and I'm going to have to go to court. So the, the lawyer's basically threatening me, and he wants me to take sides. I'm not fucking taking sides, and I'm not in this battle. I don't have time to fuck around with you guys. So, so pretty... go, do, go do what you're going to do, and if you're going to have to subpoena me, then go ahead. But I'm, you know, I'm not going to give any information willingly. Damn. So you pretty much did what you could to keep this record label going, and then you got screwed in the end? I didn't get screwed in the end. No, I benefited from it. They bought me out. Oh, oh, but... Explain bought you out then. I guess I don't fully understand. They gave me they gave me money uh, for my share of the company. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I thought you meant like they pulled the rug out from under or something like that. No, no. I mean, I was an owner. They couldn't, and and so they knew I could have sued them. So they gave me, you know, a sizable chunk of money. Now, if I would have stayed with SST, um, I would be ten times more richer in terms of the value of the the, the assets that he has. You know. He's he's rich, right? But he yeah, he's Gannon. like he's yeah, Greg Ginn, but he's like Donald Trump. He'll he's got a bunch of lawyers and he'll sue the fuck out of you, right? And so like, you know, black you know, um, Keith Morris and other people, they started to do black flag band, right? Yeah. And then he sued them and so they had to change it to the flag. So, um, that's his style, right, of suing people. The I know you haven't been involved with that for a while, but have you heard the 2013 new Black Flag album, What the? No, no. Uh, <laughs> well, um, just to say, if you look up the album art, it got moderately terrible reviews. I mean, you know, it's kind of like it's kind of like the Rolling Stones just came out with a new album, right? And so anyone that's, I mean. You know, great musicians, great artists, great mathematicians. Uh, most people do their best work when they're young. Oh well, yeah, and especially so, with and, punk, it kind of goes with it. And so, you know, they did a lot of good things, but um, the to me, in my opinion, Black Flag kind of just, you know, they just sort of dwindled away. You know, their records kept getting, to me, progressively worse. <laughs> <laughs> 
Can, can you tell me about um what happened at the Rainbow Music Hall Club? Fuck, dude. You know how many you know how many uh, uh, concerts I w- went to and what I've done. I don't I don't remember one from the other. I mean, you know, I was thrown in jail in Denver, and I and I remember yeah, that. Yeah, that's what but I was getting at there. Tr- in, in terms, oh, you're talking about in Denver. Yeah, I should have sorry okay. mentioned that Denver, okay. 80, April eighty okay. four. Okay, yeah, I I vividly remember that, and so um, we went on, and we and there was it was it was a huge crowd, right? It was probably like I don't know five thousand people, and we got and Tom Tricoli went out on the stage naked. <laughs> Fucking butt naked, bro. Oh and God. and 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 don't take this wrong, right? But I think that our antics and what we did, right? We were before the mentors. We were before. Um, oh yeah. We were before the um um. Who's that fucking um, um other guy? Gre- uh, G.G. Um, Allen. Yeah, G.G. Allen and the the red hot chili chili peppers. Oh, they all watched me. Right, they all saw me, right? Because they Black Flag was before them. Yeah. So, you know, um, I'm not going to take too much credit for it, but um, uh, um, I believe that I influenced what they did. But now they're all, um, you know, uh, icons, and I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just a uh, small punker in Long Beach. <laughs> well, I like your music, and it. Me and my uh, my buddy Jimmy from the Philippines. Uh, he, I introduced him to Nick Heist, I don't know, about a month ago, and he is yeah. fucking hooked. <laughs> He's like, I've never heard of a punk band like this. They're so crazy. They're so sexually charged. Like, holy shit, man. This band is fucking crazy. It's like, yeah. There, I wish I could have seen you guys back in the day. I was just telling, uh, I just interviewed uh, Vic Bondi of Articles of Faith not even an hour ago, and I was telling him that I, all these bands I grew up with, including yours, which I'm 26. I wish I could have seen y'all back in your prime back in the 80s. I just, <laughs> I always uh, wonder how much, what the original scene was like back then, what it was like to actually go to a hardcore show, and you know now there's safety and all that. But all uh, the stories that I read, I wish I could have experienced them myself. Well, you know, you got to make your own stories, bro. <laughs> that is true. You can't rely on the past, right? So there's a lot of stories to be made. <laughs> Damn right there are. Uh, so... But anyways, at the Rainbow Hall, to get back to the Rainbow Hall, we uh, we went on stage, and we did a little simulating anal intercourse. <laughs> and um, although you know I'm not gay, but you know I mean if somebody's gonna suck my dick, you know back then that's a different story. But anyways. Um, and then we're, you know, I'm, I'm um, recording or I'm doing the, the sound for Black Flag afterwards. And you got to remember, you know, I'm wearing, I'm wearing the same clothes that I'm wearing now, bands, Levi's, and a t-shirt, right? Damn right, dude. <laughs> and so I haven't fucking, you know, I haven't changed since then. I wasn't like, you know, there are no Mohawks, no shit like that. And I'm just sitting there, and when it was done, there was two cops there. And they said, you're going with me, son. Oh, shit. <laughs> and so they threw both. They only threw me and Tricoli in because we we were doing the explicit acts. And so um, when we were, uh, when we were in, uh, in the holding tank or in jail, uh, uh, Tom Tricoli had some weed with him in his sock. Right, and so they didn't even search us. You know, usually when you fucking, oh you know, it was way. You know, it's like nowadays. You know, if you're thrown in jail, they fucking strip you. Oh strip yeah. Shoot you. They strip search you. They fucking look up your ass and all kinds of shit. Right back then, it's like you know, it's like it was the you know er, every day we keep losing more of our freedoms. You know, as the government controls us, right? And so back then it was like you know we fucking walk. You walk a mile to school, and you're you know you're in kindergarten and shit like that, and no one cares. But uh, yeah, they threw us in jail, and then about five hours later, Greg bailed us out. And I still I still think I have a warrant for my arrest there. To this day. Probably nah. It's just a fucking mystery. I was gonna I was gonna fucking say, do those really expend out the twenty thirty years? Uh, I think there's statue of limitations on that, bro. But I, you know, I mean, come on. I, I, I showed my penis on stage. What the fuck? I mean, <laughs> yeah, there's a, 
Yeah, I, I gotta say, I mean, I, I don't know for sure, but I, it definitely looks like your band might have been of the first, if not the first, to do stuff like that. Did you guys ever play with the Crucifix and Doc Corbin Dart? And what? Have you ever played with the Crucifix and uh, Doc Corbin Dart? Doc? What's what's the Doc what? DOC Doc Corbin Dart. That's the vocalist of the Crucifix. His name is Corbin? Yeah, Doc Corbin Dart. DOC space Corbin space Dart. <laughs> Are you looking it up? Why has he got the fucking same last name as me? Who is that guy? Fuck if I know. Oh, he, he's he's ten years older than me. I bring them up because the Crucifix are all... Well, they're not sexually charged, but they're a very over-the-top and wild band I've heard from back in the 80s, and they, they're they on alternative tentacles, not SST, but they were very explosive on the set, and Doc, similar to you, has done many things to antagon, antagonize the crowd and all that, and I wondered if you guys ever did a show with them. I don't know. I mean, we did a show. I mean, I have a friend of mine. Um, I'm a runner. Um, and I've, I've done three Ironmen, and I have a friend that's a punker that does Ironmen with me, and he always is sending me um, uh, flyers of bands that I was in, and I don't remember, you know, I don't remember half the shit, so. Ironmen? <laughs> huh? Ironmen? Ironmen. You know, it's a swim, bike, run. Oh, well, I uh, don't know much about that stuff. Yeah, it's just you know in the in the in the uh, in the Olympics they do a triathlon, uh huh, and so the triathlon is swim, bike, run, and so an Ironman is, and that's an Olympic distance. So an Ironman is a, about a two mile a two mile swim, a hundred and fourteen mile bike ride, and then a marathon at the end of it. I would not last that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're 26, bro. You could do it. You just you you could you just gotta put your head into it. <laughs> yeah, I noticed on your Facebook. Uh, if you don't mind me bringing this up, you got a lot of. Looks like you're a pro biker. No, I'm not a pro biker. I I I'm not professional at all. That's just my hobby. I am like when I when I do these races, I come in I come in like the middle, you know, like 60th place. And my son says, "Why are you doing it if you if you're not going to come in first place?" <laughs> How long have you been uh, doing the bike rides for and the races for? Oh, probably like ten years. I mean, I've always ran, um, but then uh, I started to, you know, when I reached forty or so, mid forties, I, you know, it's hard to. Uh, how do I say this? You know, your metabolism slows down, so I had to do something, or I was going to be a fat fuck, and I like to drink beer, so. What's up? Uh, what beer? What beer do you drink? Do you ever drink any craft beers from any local? Breweries? Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, we're here. I don't know what city you live in. I live in Moline, Illinois. Moline, Illinois. So, um, we have. Well, you have the. What's the the goose? Isn't goose from your goose IPA from that area? I think it is. I go to Bent River all the time. To the local and brewery so, here. And so we have in, well, I mean, not in specifically in San Diego, San Diego is the home of, of uh, craft beer, right? And so um, um, Ballast Point is there, um, Lagunitas is there, and a lot of other breweries are there. So we have, uh, we have Golden Road too. So um, down the street is Ballast Point. And so that's probably their Sculpin is probably one of my fifth Sculpin. An IPA is one of my favorite beers. But there's a famous book. There is a famous book that I'm going to suggest that everyone reads, um, and it's about the origins, uh, origins of craft beer book. Let me see what's it what's it called. It's um, ah, fuck. What is it called? Give me a second here, bro. Take your time. Y'all just to add to that, craft beer is what kind of got me hooked on alcohol because I don't do Budweiser, Bush, blech, craft beer. So I'm originally from Ottawa, Kansas, and on Main Street, I have, my town's like 5,000 people total. On Main Street, in March of, I think, 2019, a brewery came into town called Not Lost Brewing Company, and 
I didn't really discover it until probably August or September 2019, but the moment I discovered craft beer, because I had never even heard of craft beer before, I just thought it was Budweiser, Bud Light, Coors, you know, the piss beers that I can't stand. All right. And so I went to Not Lost and was just blown away by the world of craft beer, and since then I've, every every time I go to a new town, I always try to find a local brewery to see what that spe- what you know, what specific chemistry they've put together. Yeah, I love craft beers. Yeah, so uh, th- there. Anyways, there's a a craft beer book, uh, and it's a it's a East Coast, it's a East Coast brewery that the guy the guy um, the guy uh, started, and he wrote a book, and he 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 is a punk rocker. Oh, nice. Right, and so in his book, he talks about he talks about. Um, um, he talks about, um, um, you know, how he is DUI, kind of like the whole punk rock scene, um, um, did all of the, you know, the, the, the whole punk rock scene um, did all this, you know, do-it-yourself shit, you know, like alternative yeah. tentacles. Um, um, uh, I'm thinking of Bad Religions. Um, Epitaph. Bad religions, bad religions uh, and so everyone's just doing it themselves, and that's the whole idea behind uh, behind uh, craft brewing is the same thing, right? But yeah. they don't, I don't fucking. It's God. I I want you to read it, man. It's a. Great, oh, I will. I'll definitely read it. It's once I figured it figure it out. I'll 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 I'll, I'll uh, Facebook you on there. Yeah, craft beer is very is a, like I said, you can get a good representation of just different places that you can go if you just uh, attend local breweries and all that. It gives you a good taste of the area, I guess you could say. Yeah. Off center books about beer. Okay, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. So, are you in front of your book? I mean, you <laughs> it's you heard of Dogfish, right? Yes. So the guy from Dogfish, he's also a cyclist, I believe, too. He's oh, a nice. cyclist. He's a punk rocker, and he book he wrote a book called Off Centered, Off Centered Leadership, and the guide to motivation, collaboration, and smart growth. And it's a it's a really great book. The guy's not like a it, you know he writes it like he's you know he probably write a or if I wrote a book, it would be like him. It's more like how I talk, and he writes it like he talks. But it's a really good book, and you should read it. It's called Off Centered Leadership, I and read it's the it. whole, it's the whole punk rock thing too. And he's got that dogfish. He's got a dogfish tattoo, but oh, his nice. back, his back is fucked up. So oh. he talks about his back and how he couldn't. But he talks about also the craft brewery where people. Um, Say they're you know it's craft beer, but what does it mean to be craft beer, right? And so like um, Golden Road, which is an LA brewery, was bought out by um, Pap not Paps Blue Ribbon, but um, Anheuser Busch, right? So all of these craft breweries have been bought out by these big breweries, and so you know um, they just become what we hate, right? And so they basically, you know, they've. Uh, made their beer like um, um, you know, just like you say the piss beer. But I happen to like beer. To me, beer is like pussy, right? <laughs> and, and most pussy is good. And so um, I like Budweiser and all that shit, you know. But, but I can get it down. Like, it's just I like some flavor to it here and there, you know. Some. Yeah, but I, I mean, I just, I mean, you know, like a beer is like, you know, you got Asian chick, you got a black chick, you got a Mexican chick. Well, they're all good. Right. <laughs> I love the way you did that's that's the greatest way you could have worded that. Do you smoke Nick, weed at all? Huh? Do you smoke weed at all? No, I don't I don't smoke weed. Oh. I uh since I live in Illinois I I'm thankful to stay it's, it's legal up here, but I tend to sometimes a couple times a week go to Bent River, get a good craft one thing that if you ever come to the Quad Cities, you definitely gotta go to Bent River because you can, they do what's called a fusion drink, where you can add multiple different beers to one mug or one howler or growler, which I haven't found many breweries that do that. 
<laughs> like if you want a, ma- a sour lime, a mango, raspberry wheat, IPA, if you want like fucking five or six different beers in one, yeah, they'll <laughs> they'll, they'll do that shit. It's fucking crazy. That's like that's like getting you know uh, uh, an Asian chick with you know a mixture of a, a black and an Asian chick. You know that's the best kind, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. You were the first person I've ever interviewed that I've actually gotten to talk about craft beer with, and I'm happy about this. <laughs> well, that's great. I love craft, but I love, you know, I love beer just like I love pussy, so. Hey, yeah, you can't go wrong with either, and especially and there's, there's, with There's the a other. lot of analogy between the two, right? <laughs> since you actually have, uh, since you're pretty informed with alcohol and beer, um, do you know of, have you had San Miguel? Yeah, I think that uh, you know San Miguel is is um, is really good, and so I know that it's from Boston, and they're Boston. to me one of the best. One oh San, no 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 no. You're talking about the Filipino beer. Yeah, the other thing. Yeah, the Boston. Filipino beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I have uh, uh, my wife is uh, from Indonesia. Oh. And so Indonesia has um 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 El their Diablo. Own, their own beer um um and i can't think of the name of it but the germans the germans went in um you know uh around the 1850s and they built um beer factories in china and indonesia and or the dutch did in indonesia and and in in uh, the philippines and in thailand so all of those beers are very are very um um uh, uh, German based, right? So San Miguel is one of them. So uh, the Philippines were um, were um, colonized by the Spaniards. Yeah. I'm so right. maybe the Spaniards went in there, and Indonesia was colonized by the Dutch, but maybe the Spaniards went into uh, to um, um, the Philippines and made San Miguel. But what 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 you do with with um, with the San Miguel beer, and you can ask your your buddy about this. Is you eat something, you take the San Miguel, and you get some salt, and you get something called balut. You know what balut is? Yes, I was gonna say I'm married in the Philippines. My wife was from there, and I've had a balut. Oh really? So you put you you know you put a little salt on it, and then you take the San Miguel and you eat that, and it'll make your dick hard for fucking an hour. I swear to God, it's like rock solid. You don't need any of that, that fucking pussy. You don't need any of that fucking pussy. Uh, um, uh, what do you call that? Um, uh, Viagra. Or Viagra. If you have to have Viagra, you shouldn't fuck. You know, you probably have a heart attack. So eat balut, have San Miguel, get a big old fucking heart on, and fuck all night. It's the real way, bro. <laughs> That's the greatest bonus. Wow, I don't even know how to follow that up. <laughs> Ask, ask, your, ask your friend. Oh, wow. Uh, Balut, oh, yeah. Balut is an aphrodisiac, bro. A what? An aphrodisiac. I'm a little wet behind the ears as to what that means. <laughs> aphrodisiac is you like, they say the green M&Ms are an aphrodisiac. If you eat it, it makes you horny. Oh. Right? So, so it's something that makes you horny. And so, uh, Balut makes you horny. You know, I've actually, now that I think about it, I think I've heard some of my Filipino punk rock friends make some jokes about that in the past. Yeah. I, no, I, I, think, I think I've heard that. Um, when you were talking about the Indonesian beer, were you referring to El Diablo? No, 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 no. Because that no. is an it's Asian. Called, it's called Bintar. Oh. Look up B-I-N-T-A-R, Bintar. 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 Actually, uh, Indonesian beer, Indo, Indo, Indonesian beer. Maybe I spelled it wrong. Bin- it's, I'm sorry. It's called Bintang. Yeah, Bintang. I found it. B- Bintang. Well, I've I've so, seen that shit in the Philippines. Yeah, well, it kind of reminds me of Heineken the way it looks. So if you look at it, it's it's it actually when you when you go to Wikipedia, right? And so it says it says um, um, that. Uh, the beer started in 1929 when Heineken Jesus. Beer Company established its first brewery in Sarabaya, East Java. And that's actually, Sarabaya is where, that's the part of uh, Indonesia that my wife is from. Oh, nice. Wow. And so that's that's East Java, and they have like a, they have a, you know, kind of like, you have Chinese, you have uh, Mandarin and Cantonese, so the Indonesia have like dialects uh, in each yeah. part of the country, and so they have their 
like like uh, the Philippines. Yeah, they, they got over like, like two hundred the... different dialects for different tribal yeah, regions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck. <laughs> I still can't get over that balut dick hard thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna test this shit out when I return. Game, game on, bro. Game on, bro. Yeah, damn. But you have to, you have to drink the San Miguel, right? Which, San which? Miguel, a, do you know which San Miguel I need to drink? Because there's a few different versions of it now. There's Pell Pilsen. There's the. Yeah, I know the San Miguel's got a couple different versions now. It's like oh, San Miguel. Actually, my 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 one of my good friends lives in. San Miguel, Mexico, and he comes back and forth from from Mexico to um, to uh, uh, California. Nice. Yeah, San Miguel, Perry Pearson. You know, it's kind of funny on the topic of San Miguel here, since I don't think I'll get this opportunity to talk about this in any other interview. Is um, so you know how I said earlier that I'm not really a fan of piss beers, as I like to call them. Yeah. yeah. San Miguel actually opened my door to like. Previously, before 2018, before I moved to the Philippines for the first time, I couldn't drink beer. I just, I just couldn't do it. I went to the Philippines. Holy shit, the beer is cheap as fuck there. 50 pesos is a dollar. I can get a big-ass bottle for 20 pesos, 50 cents. So I started drinking the harder beers, such as San Miguel. And it kind of, in a way, when I returned to the U.S., I could then drink Budweiser. And, you know, I don't like them necessarily, but... If I'm at a bar or at a friend's house and someone hands me a, a Budweiser, thanks to me drinking San Miguel so much when I was there, I can now stomach the other beers from this country. So I will give San Miguel credit for that. So it says, the history of San Miguel traces back to 1890 when a group of Spaniards decided to open its first brewery in Southeast Asia, specifically in Manila. Manila. So it was, yeah, so... It was produced by the Spaniards before before Bintar and 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 all of those. So you go through, and it was the it was the Europeans that were coming up with these beer beer factories, bro. Yeah. How long did you live in the Philippines? Um, I've actually been there twice. The first time was only forty five days, but the second time was from May 29, twenty eighteen, to February twenty twenty nineteen. So nine consecutive months, which is when I got married and. As soon as I'm able, I'm going to return there to live there with my wife. Oh, wow. Cool, bro. Yeah, I love the Philippines. It's my second home country. I, at To a degree, I kind of consider it more of a home than the U.S. sometimes, but depends on the day. <laughs> a lot of hot chicks there, bro. I'm sure you're like, uh, you're like, uh, you're a man in demand. <laughs> I, I'll say, I mean, I'm not the most attractive guy in the world, but yeah, there were times where I couldn't. When my wife's with me, no one comes up to me, but if I walk down the street on my own or I go to the supermarket on my own, yeah, I've, I've been flirted with, girls have flirted with me. Oh, and, yeah. And it is a, it. it's a much different feeling because in the U.S., no girl flirts with me, really. I mean, sometimes here and there, but not as vibrant as it is in the Philippines. Like, there was an electronic store that I used to go to to buy batteries, and, uh, they just, they're like Radio Shack, honestly, but the girl who worked at the counter, every time I'd come in there, even if I wasn't going to that, so she'd, hey, she'd wave at me, and it's like, I'm so not used to this. Yeah, oh yeah, bro. <laughs> yeah, very vibrant community over there, which, um, I was gonna ask another question on, uh, Nig Heist before I completely forget, um, so you said that the demise of Nig Heist was when you went to, uh, work for, uh, SST, were, yes. there, were there ever plans on a second Nig Heist album, or just uh, snort my load? No, there was never. There was never plans on it. You know, I mean, when I was touring with uh, Black Flag and the Meat Puppets, I was writing my song. The uh, Meat Puppets. Writing a song, huh? The Meat Puppets. Yeah, yeah. So I was writing a song in the in the van, and and Kurt, or I forgot. I don't remember if it's uh, guitar players, Kurt, Chris. But uh, I was writing the song, and it was it was it was called "This Is the Story of My Butthole," <laughs> and uh, uh, he started to play it on stage, you know. So he took my song; he could listen to it. He's so good listening to it. He goes, "This is the story of my butthole." <laughs> <laughs> fucking funnier than shit. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it says here in 83, uh, when the 
Th- Thermidor Records released the one song Nick High 7 Inch called Walking Down the Street. Raymond yeah. Pettibone did the artwork for that. Yeah. Yeah, are you pretty good friends with Raymond still or Uh Raymond is uh an eccentric sort of uh uh oddball, you know, probably ninety nine percentile in terms of his uh brain capacity. So yeah, I'm his friend. Uh I posed for him naked. Um, I was, I was his, uh, what do you call it? You know, when, you know, I do different poses for him when he was painting back in the day. So I hung out with him, uh, and stuff like that. So yeah, you know, I'm, I'm his friend, but in terms of friends, you know, he's, he still thinks that, you know, I'm, you know, he puts me in with the whole SST contingent, which, um, there was some problems, um, with him and us, um, back then. So, I didn't want to use, you know, everyone got mad at me for not using one of his artworks on my album, and I probably should have put it on there in retrospect, but I didn't want to, I didn't put it on my label. I didn't put, um, I didn't put uh, my, that album on my label because I didn't want to, you know, I thought it was nepotism type of, you know, I felt like, you know, let it go on its own, but, um, um, Greg and all those dudes put their shitty ass Gone and October Faction and Swa and all that shitty music on uh, on SSD, which was to me totally stupid. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not as I don't really know all the bands from SSD, but yeah, I see what you mean there. Damn, uh, have you? What's your? Did you ever hang out with Henry Rollins at all? Any thoughts on him? Um, I mean, you've read his book in the band, right? In the in the band, right? I've 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 listened to the audio. Oh yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm in there, and he talks about me, but it's more of a it's more of a, a working um, sort of uh, a relationship that we had with him and I. It wasn't like, I mean, he's 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 a rich kid. He's a rich, you know, wasp. We went into his house, and you know, his mother. She, uh, uh, looked after us, and you know, she, her maid cooked us food. Her maid, <laughs> you know, and they're both they're both uh, Wall. No, they're both Washington lawyers. They probably work for Trump now, and so um, and so I'm from this little this little ghetto city. My mother's Mexican, and I'm from this little ghetto city uh, in 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 California where you know people would rob your house every day. So it's just a different background and sometimes the wasp versus the half Mexican, you know, we don't really see eye to eye based on our upbringing. <laughs> yeah, I will say uh I, I emailed Henry earlier this year to try to get an interview from him since he doesn't use social media whatsoever and at first he said that he do some written questions, and then he recently told me that the window for that's closed. But he's he did send me a birthday present. He sent me the liar promo single, with uh, signed. So I gotta thank him for that. But yeah, for for me talking to Henry, he seems rather to himself, or not enough to himself. Like you know the Joe Rogan podcast. No. Uh, it, it's one of the biggest podcasts on YouTube, but Henry went on there and he said that six days a week his phone is turned off and that he hates it when people contact him. Yeah, but you know, it's like, I mean, come on, bro. He's like this, he's been the center of t- attention, you know, it's like yeah. any typical, any typical rock star or, or movie star or whatever. He's been in movies and all of that. He's a really good looking guy. You know, everywhere we went, you know, just chicks, you know, you talk about you being in the Philippines, but we being in, in, uh, in, uh, in America, even, even not knowing that he was Henry Rollins, chicks would come up to him. I mean, I'm fucking, I am uh, totally invisible. I walk around and no one even looks at me. Anywhere I go, any shop that I go in, I am fucking invisible. Right. And with him, people, you know, even back then, I was an invisible. Right. Like, you know, just a you know, typical white dude. And so or I look white, I'm half Mexican, but um, or I'm a light skinned Mexican, as they say. But he was the center of attention, even without without the black flag thing. So he's had that all his life. So he's been blessed with Damn. with uh, really good looks. Right. And so sometimes that gets you. 
that gets you a lot in life, right? <laughs> How, uh, it open, out, opens a lot of doors. Other of us have to fucking work hard to get what we want. How many interviews do you have you, I guess, let's say conducted? Like since... Probably 20. In total? Yeah. Jesus. Maybe 30. I don't know. Wow. I would have. What? I would have. No, I just would have imagined that you'd. Uh, I mean, you're you're part of the Black Flag era. I, I I'd imagine that you'd have uh, fans coming at you. From what you no. just, what you just told me, I'd kind of imagine the opposite of it. Oh no! You know, it's funny. Every once in a while, I'll be walking around, and somebody will say, "Hey, mugger!" <laughs> it's, like... <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> And so it's like, oh, you know, it's almost like shocking, you know, that, that um, and I think it's because of that movie, um, America Hardcore. Oh, the documentary? That, yeah, that people people see me in that, and so that sort of, you know, there's a face to what was going on, but, you know. Is it mostly younger or older people who? Younger you know, people. Younger, younger people. Interesting. Yeah. Younger people like your age that would come <laughs> up that are, that are, you know, if you're a fan, it's it's kind of like if you watch a movie, right? You want to you if you really like the movie, you're going to look at all the people that are in the movie and 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 you know research the where they're from and and who they're dating and stuff like that. So the well, same. I don't go true. that far, but yeah. The people that people that are into music, you know, a lot. And I'm not really, you know, it's like my friend was talking about Nirvana and and the Food Fighters, and I don't, I could not tell you. If, if, if you listen to, if I listen to Nirvana or the Food Fighters, I couldn't tell you uh, which one is which. I know that it's that sort of genre. And the same with like old school rap, you know, like, you know, like Sno I know Snoop Dogg because he's from Long Beach and I'm from Long Beach. But all of these, you know, straight out of Compton and now with uh, Kanye West and all <laughs> of these rappers now, you know, I don't know which one is which because I don't sit, uh, you know, I'm just listening yeah, to Yeah, I, it, I, I get what you mean. And so um, there are some people that are just casual listeners to music, and so and some people are into it. And the people that are into it, you know, there's not a lot of them, but those that do, you know, do a lot of the research on it. Yeah, I could tell you now that if you played the radio for me today and said, "Hey, you get ten bucks if you can name the song," I probably couldn't do it with the <laughs> modern music. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, one of my housemates who I smoke weed with occasionally, he plays songs for me. It's like, it's like everybody knows this song. What's this song? And I'm like, um, yes, I, I've heard it <laughs> on the radio, but don't know. Dude, this is from Led Zeppelin or Queen or, you know, Kanye or Cypress Hill. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Whoops. I know Cypress Hill because they're kind of like a little bit punk and... <laughs> Yeah, Kanye West tried to run for president, and he got 60,000 votes. Really? <laughs> yeah, I found that. To, everybody thought that was a publicity stunt, which it probably was, because Kanye's got a big ego, and he likes to do stuff like that. But he actually got 60,000 votes in the U.S. 2020 election. <laughs> I, almost, I, I saw him on the ballot, and I almost voted. You did? <laughs> I was, like, almost thinking about voting for him. Wow. But I just, I wanted, you know, I mean, I'm not a, I, I mean, I, don't really like talk about politics but you know i'm not a i'm sort of in the middle but you know i just wanted one certain to one person one certain person to lose by a lot that's why i, I voted i didn't vote for kanye i voted for the other guy <laughs> if so you're in california right yeah so Ka kanye west was on a california ballot that's funny yeah yeah, he was. He was. I think he was on all ballots, right? So, well, no, because he, he, he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't the president uh, running for. Pre he was vice president. So there was somebody else that was running for. Were on his ticket. Right? Oh, so okay. He wasn't voting. For, he wasn't running for president. It was vice president. I wonder what party? Because I'm in Illinois, and he definitely was not on the ballot that I used. On, oh. on mine was. Uh, obviously, Trump and Pence, Com Biden, Kamala, and a couple the Libertarian Party, who just a bunch of people who I didn't care. But I definitely did not see Kanye's name on there. Oh, okay. A little well, disappointed I saw in that because that would be kind of funny. <laughs> but uh, is there anything else you wanted to add to this, my friend? No, I just wanted to say one more thing that uh, you know I also came up with the name Cro-Mags. That's my yeah. band that I was going to start a punk band, and that fucker stole it. From Are me. you serious? I'm serious, bro. So Talk it pisses about... me off. It pisses me off. Tell me about that. 
Oh, you know, I can send you a picture of Harley and I, or Marley or Harley, whatever his, his name is. I know he's, I know he's into, um, uh, into um, martial arts, so I, he'd probably come over to my house and kick my ass. But um, we were just hanging out, and I always wanted to come up with, uh, you know, I came up with the, the you know, the name cro right? And that was going to be my hardcore punk band that I was thinking about starting, because I already had Nick Heist, which was sort of a joke band. Yeah. So he just took it, and you can you can read about it. I mean, there's you can Google it, and he'll say that we came up with it together, but uh, that's uh, far from the case. Since you came <laughs> up with it, did you guys ever? How long were you a part of the Crow Mags? I was no, I was in New York hanging out with them with Black Flag, and, oh, and so. we were hanging around with the uh, Bad Brains, and so I said, hey, you know, this, this I'm going to start up, I'm going to start up. Uh, hard, hardcore punk band called the Crow Mags. You want to be in it? <laughs> oh, God. And I was going to play guitar, right? So uh, he stole it. Ouch. And now, and now, and now, there's another guy who's also a uh, triathlete like me who's in the Crow Mags. That now they're fighting over the name, kind of like Black Flag is fighting over the name. So there's some internal divisions amongst them. Yeah, the <laughs> Crow Mags actually just released a new record this year. I haven't heard it yet but my local record store co-op records my buddy mason who works there he is like hey dude you're a fan of chrome mags it's a corral right it's like yeah he's like dude they got a new album called in the beginning it just released this year i'm sure it's fucking pretty shitty oh i haven't heard it yet <laughs> it's but... just again it's just like the rolling stones album that they just released or any any you know they're just they're just trying to stir the pot and make some money Rocky George, no, let's see. yeah, Rocky George, guy, uh, Harley is in the band currently. Oh, and, oh, wow. uh, Harley, I'm what? looking at the Wikipedia membership on it. Yeah, it appears that Harley is in the band. Some person named Gabby is the uh, rhythm guitarist. Craig Satari, Satari is the bassist, and the. They well, they should know. fucking, they should pay me some fucking royalties, right? Gary <laughs> Sullivan's the drummer. Harley appears to be one of the, the only original member of the band that's currently in it. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, there's another guy in it that, and he's probably releasing his own Crow Mags. But anyways, oh, bro, God. as we say, as we say, uh, Salamat. Uh... Salamat po. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Magandang uh, God, Gabi, since it's, uh, Relatively 4:30 p.m. I mean that's not be a magang dang. Uh, fuck, I forgot how to say good evening. <laughs> in, in, in Indonesia, they, there are certain words that are the same in Tagalog, and one is well, they when you say like good evening, it's it's salamat the tongue, and so it's the same word as thank you in Tagalog. So there's uh, a, you know there's you know kind of similar yeah. like. Uh, you know, French and German, you know, there's a lot of um, crossover there. Magandang Tangali. I think that's good evening in Filipino. Oh, okay. There you go, bro. My brain is half broken. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, thank you well, so much good, for this. Good luck. I, I, hope, I hope you, I hope you, uh, you get a lot of hits off this. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I've enjoyed this conversation, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, buddy. Take care. Yep. Bye-bye.